What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Both Laugh, the Dying Scene Quarantine Chat Show. We are still, I suppose, in quarantine, although it does seem increasingly like we've either uh, stopped caring or it has gotten better, and the truth is somewhere probably in the middle. Regardless, uh, this week's episode is number 55, um, and it is uh, a fun one, but I always say that, I know, and someday you'll stop believing me, but it's true. Um, this is the third time I've had the chance to interview this guest. The first time was nine years ago, which seems uh, a little bizarre. Um, that one was over the phone. We met up one time almost five years ago in person, backstage at a club before a show. And now we did the podcast thing. We met up over Zoom, he from his house in Florida, me from my house in Massachusetts, and uh, we had a chat. Uh, I should probably tell you that his name is Jason Black. He's the founding bass player of Hot Water Music, which I think we would all agree is one of the most influential bands in the punk rock scene of the last 25 years. Uh, and we talked about that. We talked about what it's like to be uh, an iconic band and whether being an iconic band translates to being a commercially successful band. And uh, that turns into an interesting conversation. We talk a lot about the differences between playing big shows in uh, Europe versus playing big shows here. Uh, we talk a lot about the new album. Uh, the new album is out ma March 18th, I believe, on a new label. They're a new label to them, Equal Vision Records. Obviously, Equal Vision's been around a long time. But this is their first time putting out a Hot Water Music album. They also recorded with Brian McTernan. Uh, McTernan recorded a handful of albums with them 20 years ago. He, of course, recorded Caution which is one of everybody's favorite albums. Uh, it is certainly the album that got me into Hot Water Music uh, slightly under two decades ago. Um, I was familiar with their name, but realistically had not listened to them prior to that. And I forget where, um, but I heard Hot Water Music. I heard Trusty Chords. And that was kind of the watershed moment when I went, holy shit, this band is unlike anything I've ever heard. Uh, and so it's been a fun, probably 18 years since then. Uh, they hadn't recorded with McTurnan in a while. Uh, they essentially recorded the last couple albums with their front of house engineer, Ryan, um, and decided they needed a producer this time. And so they went with an old buddy. Brian McTurnan, as most of you know, also plays uh, fronts the band Be Well, who have their sophomore album coming out later this year. They're also opening a bunch of shows for Hot Water Music. And uh, he took the reins of this Hot Water Music album project, um, which is a decidedly different project because it was recorded during quarantine. And just like some of us uh, have been Zoomed um, ad nauseum over the last couple of years, and uh, gotten used to our breakout rooms and our weekly Zoom meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some bands are no different. And some bands wrote albums that way. And to me, that was a really fascinating way to uh, collaborate and make an album. So Jason talks a lot about that. Um, they've also obviously got Chris Creswell in the mix. This is the first full length that Creswell appears on. Um, if you have heard the album, you know that he sings lead vocals. Uh, on one song, which is a, a welcome thing to me. Creswell's got one of the better voices probably of the last 15 years. So uh, it's nice to have him hold his own against the two powerhouses that are Chuck Reagan and Chris Wallard. Uh, this is a fun episode. I know I say that all the time. Um, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the guys in Hot Water Music. They've been more than gracious over the years. And it's it's a really great thing when you can meet a band that is as iconic and genre defining as hot water music is and have them enjoy talking to you. Uh, it means a lot. Um, hopefully you are also enjoying our Women's History Month project, Females in Focus, our collaboration with the Gals of Mabel Syndrome. It's been really fun so far. We've gotten a lot of good feedback. We've had some amazing pictures of some amazing artists by some amazing women photographers and you should make sure that you check them all out like them all, follow them all. They're doing really great work. And even though I've been shooting concert photography for close to a decade now, uh, those women, um, they, they inspire me all the time to someday be almost half that good. And we've got a lot of really great ones coming too. I, I will tell you that. Uh, but without any further ado, episode 55 with Jason Black starts now. 
All right, it is time for uh, episode 55 of Both Laugh, the Dying Scene Quarantine Chat Show. And once again, we're joined by someone who theoretically should need no introduction because he has been holding down the low end for a band that's been not just one of the most influential bands of the last three decades, but really one of a select few, I think, genre-defining bands. Uh, Their ninth full-length album is due out March 18th on Equal Vision Records. It's Dynamite. The album is called Feel the Void. The band is called Hot Water Music. Uh, which means the guest, of course, is Jason Black. Hello, sir. Thanks for doing this. This is an honor. Oh, no sweat. Thanks for thanks for talking to me again. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I think this is the third time now. I uh, think so. <laughs> over, the, over the course of nine years, which uh, is wild, actually, because it doesn't seem like, I think the first time we talked was when the draft was doing the, the thing again. Uh-huh. And I was looking back at my notes from that as sort of... Uh, my own sort of research for my own interview and I said holy shit that was nine years ago (laughs) yeah it's it's like that these days (laughs) I'm not really sure how that happened Uh, but either way um it and and it's sort of become like a unofficial quest of mine to have some of my all-time favorite bass players on this show we've only really been doing this show since the start of quarantine a because the dying scene website itself is undergoing a massive rebuild right now so doesn't really make sense to write because I don't have a place to post things, but it was a good way to sort of keep in touch with people that were figuring out in real time sort of new ways to do things and how to stay connected to each other, both in bands and in the scene and with their fans and things like that. So, um, but I, as somebody who wished he grew up uh, a professional bass player, it's sort of a goal of mine to talk to all my favorite bass players too, but right on. not that it's like bass player magazine or anything like that, but still, <laughs> but still I always, uh, I feel like bass players don't get enough credit. And uh, so, and seriously, I feel like you're, does it, is it weird to have people say that you're one of the most underrated bass players? Because I feel like people say that, but then I also feel like it's a weird thing to call somebody um, underrated especially when they're really good. <laughs> I mean, I thank you um, for that. And I, I mean, I don't, I guess it's sort of, it's not weird to me in the way that um, I try not to, um, I'm always trying to be better. There isn't a show that we play that I don't make a mistake during. So it's kind of like, I have a, I have a pretty good sense of self with bass playing, but I don't think it's like too, uh, um, like, uh, uh, I feel like it's pretty reasonable where I'm like, I understand that there, um, <clears throat> it's not particularly hard for me to play bass, um, but I still could do, there's a lot of things that I can't do or a lot of things that I would love to, to have the time to learn how to do mostly. Um, really? That yeah, surprises I, me actually. It's like, I don't have, I mean, man, I got no, all the time that I'm like, yeah, I should practice today. Just <laughs> poof, yeah, gone yeah. constantly. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then, I mean, the underrated part, I feel like that just kind of, and this isn't a like um, complaint or a plea for more people to like our band. Like we've always been less popular than people think we are, I guess is the easiest way. To <laughs> it. You know what I mean? People are like, you guys are legendary. I'm like, that is awesome. <laughs> However, like, right, you, this doesn't come with what you think it comes with, yeah, as far yeah, as right. <laughs> like, you know, what it's success or however you want to put it. You know, we've sold not very many records, even at our peak, and now you just don't sell any. Um, yeah. you know, the biggest shows we ever play are like reunion shows, whenever we decide to break up and get back together. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. That's a you great know, marketing ploy. Yeah, you know, how many are left, right? Right. So it's not, um, and again, none of that is like, oh my God, we're in this terrible position as a band. How will we ever continue? It's just yeah, yeah. not, um, at least in the States. In Europe, it's pretty different. Like, like, we're much bigger in Germany than we are in America. And like, reasonably bigger in the UK than here, and definitely on a per capita basis. So... I guess that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, you know, like, but yeah, when people are like, you go, oh my God, you guys are whatever. I'm like, dude, you don't really want to trade places with this. Trust <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I did a, I did do a story just before the world shut down where I talked to Chuck and I talked to Chris Creswell to sort of have two interesting 
uh, bookends to the 20, it was around when the 25th anniversary shows were happening or mm -hmm. whatever. And so one of the things I asked Chuck is when you guys realized that 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 sort of thing was happening. Like there's a lot of us in the scene who, like I said, credit you with not just being influential, but really being genre defining. And when did you sort of realize that that stuff was happening, that it wasn't just like, oh, we're a cool band that plays in Gainesville, but it's like, there's this bigger movement that somehow you got credited with helping to spearhead, which maybe is a weird thing to wrap your head around when you're the one going through it. But when did you realize that that sort of stuff was actually happening? I think a lot of it, it was probably a good amount of hindsight. Like maybe once we stopped playing like around when the draft started and Chuck like kind of went to do a solo thing. And then I, at least for me, I feel like that was kind of the first uh, time frame that I could look at bands and be like, oh, I see what people are saying. Like the kind of like quote unquote fest bands are like, yeah, yeah. you know, PBR core beard, whatever, <laughs> right, right. Bit, you know, and, and it sucks. Cause I'm never like, <laughs> It's not like anything. I'm like, that's such a cool name to have inspired this whole group of people. Today. Yeah, yeah, right. It's always right. like, oh my god, it just sounds like a train wreck, no matter how you look <laughs> at it. Um, <clears throat> so there was kind of that, and then there, I think, kind of peppered in with that. There's a lot of weird, not weird stuff, but when you get to like, we would get to know like the guys in Thursday, and like Jeff being like, you guys are a huge influence on us, which is weird in the way that like they went just huge and to me don't sound anything like us so there are there is kind of like a fork in the road there where it's like i know there's a lot of um you know bands in, in there not like just like thursday but bands in that general zone that are like fans and then also then the bands that like i think were more um influenced on their face um you know face value style wise so um but it's cool like i can't you know, I'm not, I don't think about that very often. Um, I suppose it's probably weird if you do. Yeah. Right? Like, like that's kind of a weird thing to do. I like, mostly, I think about it when I'm trying to like, if we're working through shows and who we're going to have play shows, then I'll start thinking about it in that, in kind of like a broad context of who would fit on the shows. And it just usually ends up being whichever friends we have that are available for them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and anyway, so it's like, okay, cool. You guys can do the shows. That'll be good. Um, and luckily a lot of our, our friends kind of like fit into the, the, um, loosely into our world. So. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Chuck sort of said that it was like the first time going to Europe. And, and so maybe that speaks to that you're such, uh, more popular in, in Germany and UK than here, at least per capita that like, that's sort of a, a way to realize that, wow, there's actually like people know who we are and people care who we are. It's not just like Florida or the Southeast or the East coast or whatever. It's like, there's this whole scene that existed that, that maybe you weren't even necessarily clued into, especially in the early days. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, I, I think that, you know, the more, I think the more it's like definitely in Europe. And then also, I mean, the, like the craziest fans are in Brazil. I feel like probably, everybody says that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the and in a positive way, but that's the place where it's like the first time we went down there and played and I went out to get in the van afterwards, I was like, fuck, this was a mistake. <laughs> like not like it like, okay, well here I am. I hope I have a pen or a Sharpie or something. Yeah, this yeah. Is where I'm at for the next hour, which is awesome. But like super um that's not like a comfortable position for me as a my my personality. And yeah. like it's weird because that just doesn't happen for us um so but yeah i think getting once you get out of your comfort zone and start seeing that things are kind of you know percolating and spreading and, and whatever then you can you get a little perspective on like oh yeah we we had a hand in, in doing something that hopefully is cool um and that you know it, it, i'm glad that other people kind of you know got on board and are, are doing their thing it does giving i feel like this is an interesting year in the hot water music camp i feel like there's a lot of um I, although i guess the longer that you're a band the more uh the more anniversaries you have but i feel like there's a bunch of them this year not only does caution turn 20 but um but exister turns 10 next month and then obviously uh fuel for the hate game just turned 25 like whatever sunday or monday or something like that 
that's wild. <laughs> it means we put out too many records. That's what it is. <laughs> Um, or that we've been a band for too long. I was just talking <laughs> with someone about that earlier, and I, I kind of it. Uh, I don't know if I'm the odd man out in this, but I'm the. La- I, I was pretty pumped on the 25th anniversary. Those shows went really well, and it was a really cool idea to have like the caution and flight plays, and I, I think or caution and no division plays, and I think everyone was stoked on that. And then we did a flight play at Fest because that was going to be flights. 2021 was flight's um 20th anniversary and for that i was like let's just do two shows we don't need to do this whole thing again but then like now you're saying we've got to exist all these records and i'm kind of like you know what man let's just pop <laughs> that shit kids put out a new record and do our thing because someone's like your 30th anniversary is in a few years and i'm like oh my god bro. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right like, that's awesome but we just did 20 and 25. like do we have to do 30. but for whatever it's wor- for me from a band member perspective it's kind of boring to keep doing that but people really enjoy it so that's like i think that it's important to do stuff that people enjoy also with the band you know because we wouldn't be doing a band if we just did things yeah, that yeah. people don't like so um I'm hoping that we get through the year without any anniversary plays. I think we will. Um, but then in a couple of years, when the 30th comes around, I think we'll be we're pr- probably going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. about getting older, I guess. <laughs> well, ultimately, that's what it is. It's 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 just uh, it's accumulating numbers. It, it's like baseball players, right? That just totally. played for a long time. It's like, yep. yeah, yeah, Derek Jeter got 3,000 hits, but he also played for 21 years or whatever yeah. it is. Like <laughs> Totally. <laughs> Which congratulations on your Braves winning the World Series finally. <laughs> Damn, oh God, thank you. How, how did you end up a Braves fan? I'm always curious about that. Um, just growing up in Florida, we didn't have. Oh right, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we didn't have the Marlins or because I lived just since I was six, so the Marlins weren't a team yet, and the Rays weren't a team yet, and because of TBS, I mean, I knew about all the Cubs growing up too because of WGN. Yep. So yep. it's like just kind of that. Those were the teams that were on, so those were the teams that we ended up watching. I was exactly the same way. I grew up, I mean, in New Hampshire, so we certainly had Red Sox games on, but the Red Sox were pretty garbage quite a while. And the Braves and the Cubs, I feel like they were always playing during the day, at least, so you could always come home from school and there was a day game on and whatever. So even though I was, whatever, 2,500 miles away, I rooted for a lot of those. I mean, the Cubs were kind of garbage through the 80s and early 90s too, but but, uh, I definitely, like I watched probably more Braves games than Red Sox games for a period of time there. Uh, not just because they were really good, but uh, that certainly helped, but they were always on TV and they yeah, were on you t- just would turn it on. Like you said, and they had a lot of four o'clock games and stuff like that. So you get home and just be like, Oh, here's baseball. And these are the people that are playing. So yeah, that's just kind of, that's how I ended up, uh, ended up a Braves fan. And yeah, finally a world series again. And you kept and- with it. You didn't jump ship when the Rays came to town or. No, I didn't. Um, and I mean, I kind of like would we, I mean, I definitely like weaved in and out of how much attention I pay and it's ramped up. I it started ramping up again once MLB TV became a thing. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Like I was like, okay, so this is cool. I can actually like it's 162 games is a lot of shit to pay attention to. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, I can watch every game in 20 minutes the next morning and then read about it for a couple minutes. Okay, great. So that kind of gave me like a a lifeline to to staying on top of it um, and actually watching the players and not just having no idea who's who. Um, I don't go as much attention as I do pay. I'm not in that crazy zone of where I will just watch any team play baseball. I mean, I will if there's like, I don't know if I'm in a hotel on tour yeah, yeah, and yeah. no one else is there and there's baseball and that's definitely what i'll watch but um i don't do like the split screen with four games on it, and i couldn't tell you what i'm watching i couldn't tell you if it's a curveball or a slider like it just, <laughs> i'm like i was fast and he missed like yeah, yeah right you right. know um but i i i generally um i like the game a lot and uh you know i think the lockout sucks but i totally get it um, yeah, I think that. it sucks too. Uh, I thought the one in 94 sucked and I thought that that taught everybody that we weren't going to do that again. Uh, and here we are. Yep. So, it's, it seems like that was, it seems like 94 was a lot uh, closer to now than it was. I know, right? Like <laughs> I, 20 years ago. Fuck. 
So I don't know. I'm probably gonna end up doing what everyone else does and just I'm just gonna get like the college subscription or something and we'll end up watching college baseball. This year college baseball league. is fun. And, yeah, college baseball is fun. I got into that probably a decade or so ago because I had a friend that went from New Hampshire, but he went down to South Carolina to play. So I got into a lot of like big South Conference baseball and stuff like that. It's fun to me. It's like. I mean, obviously it's metal bat, so it's a little different, but it's like National League Baseball. Like I will, unlike you, I'll watch baseball whenever it's on, as long as it's National League Baseball. I, I think American League Baseball is too slow. Mind you, I live 15 minutes from Fenway Park. Uh, right. So so I kind of have to watch the Red Sox and I follow them sporadically, but I grew up more watching minor, um, National League Baseball. We had a Pirates uh, minor league team in the town that I grew up in. So I just sort of became a Pirates fan, even though like I grew up in New Hampshire, for God's sake, but, <laughs> but that's just what I started watching. I rooted for the Mets in the 86 world series, which is the thing that I probably shouldn't say out loud being in the Boston area, <laughs> but, but I did because I watched more national league baseball than, and I didn't like Roger Clemens. I thought he was a dick. Even when I was like seven. I mean, you were right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as, as it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about the record. This is a really, really good record, and I think it's, I think it'll be right in the wheelhouse for most hot water music fans. But I think there's some elements that might surprise some people too. There's some different sounds and different feels on the album. How was the writing process for this one? I know we've talked before about how things have changed since sort of being in three or four corners of the globe, and I guess two different countries at this point but yeah right. uh, but but have you guys sort of settled into a groove when it comes to writing differently now um i mean i think so this one was a little different in that i mean a there's five of us writing now instead of four and so that definitely you know um chris definitely had an impact on things for sure and uh, we did this was a much more focused like remote writing we did a little like chris Waller and George and I did some in person, a couple in person demo sessions, um, just because we're all close enough to to do some in person playing and have like some better skeletons to work with. <clears throat> but most of the remote stuff, it was more focused because um, McTurnan was kind of well, I mean, was definitely quarterbacking the whole process. So we would have scheduled zooms once a week where we would go over everything and like kind of break off and have side zooms with just a couple of us like okay you guys try to figure out a bridge for this song so and so try to figure out lyrics for this it was like super that's really interesting yeah yeah it, it was really collaborative and, and pretty organized that way so everyone had a task to you know complete and then if they didn't you would be like dude what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> everyone else did theirs and we're yeah, all busy, yeah, yeah. you know so um it, once we got to the studio we were pretty like pretty good on what was going to go on the record and had a few we had a few days of full pre-production like i want to say it was like three or four just kind of running through all the songs and making sure everything was was tight and then doing the like, okay, does anyone have anything left that we haven't messed with yet? And then um, off we went. So it was a different process in that it was a more organized um, remote thing, but it, it went, it went really well. It took a little longer than we were hoping for, but in hindsight, that all worked out well. Like it was like, oh God, we're going to, you know, we pushed recording back a few months at one point and it's like, the record's still not coming out till March and we're just <laughs> now kind of like getting around the corner on, on or hopefully around the corner on the pandemic enough to where shows are fairly okay and not a total crap shoot and never, you know, so in hindsight, all of our delays were great, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. it was like, oh my God, it's taking forever. Um, well, I suppose the pandemic plays an interesting role in that if, if before when you were writing songs digitally or, or sending them to each other digitally anyway. It's sort of like email somebody and then they do their thing and email it back to you or whatever. But I guess the benefit of the pandemic is now that we're all just used to Zoom as a necessary mm -hmm. evil at this point. But I never really thought of it in a songwriting context that to have a weekly meeting and then your side groups are just like working on songs. That's actually really interesting. And yeah, it, it, it was good and it kept everyone engaged too because a week, like every week can be like, you're like, oh my God, a week's already gone by, I have another damn Zoom meeting. But 
at the same time, if you don't do that, you'll just get until the day before and then try to get everything, you know, just whatever happens. So having them broken up in between and having a couple follow-ups was good because you could, like I was saying, you just get a more focused point of attack on the, you know, this song or that song or whatever. Um, and, you know, we, we, we pulled it through. It got a little hairy a couple times because um, <laughs> it's also easy to like lose people when you're doing it on Zoom for people to just kind of like, Ooh, Go, yeah, go yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah um as it was i feel just during the pandemic in general it's pretty easy to kind of space out oh um, yeah you know so we uh we lucked out but yeah it was i i think we would probably follow a similar route um moving forward with writing it would do a little more in person if we could but i think it's a really good way to get a um like a grip on what you have to yeah, work yeah. with you know where was the decision i love brian mcturnan uh, both as a person and his music, but also his his production style. Where was that decision come from to sort of to go back to that? It had been what, uh, 04 was maybe the last album that he produced of yours? It was. Um, well, we had decided that we were going to record in Gainesville again at Black Bear with Ryan yeah. our, Williams, our front of house guy, and engineered the record, and he had done the last two records. Um, we kind of, I, I mean, I feel like it was a conversation between me and Chuck that kind of got us there. At some point I was like, I think we need a producer because we're not, to me, we weren't, we weren't getting as far as we should have with the last record and the last EP in the way that I felt like it was a little bit of like, I phoning it in is absolutely the wrong way to put it. Um, but a little bit of like, I got this, we know how to do this band. We got yeah, yeah, like yeah. a little bit of like a little too complacent, I guess maybe. Um, and just like, yeah, we'll make a record and it'll be cool. And like, and I really liked Light It Up and I really like Shake Up The Shadows, but I know that they were missing, there were things missing from them for me anyway. Um, and, and I think for the rest of the guys too, that like, we just hadn't quite, um, had the outside, it's good to have someone that's not afraid to just piss us off. Um, and, you yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. and that we know too. So it's it's a lot harder when we piss each other off to get through it than if someone else pisses us off. Yeah, so, yeah, right. um, I think that was really helpful. And, and Brian definitely like, you know, just d being able to do things like working on a song with Wallard and he's like, yeah, I don't know if I can like, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. And then, you know, Brian being like, dude, you just did, you did that on caution all over the place. You're not dead. Like you can do it again. Like just <laughs> that kind of like, you know, it, it's just pushing us, all of us to like do something better. And, and I mean, kind of his tagline for the whole thing was like, I want to make the, I'm a fan of your band. So I want to make the record that I want to hear from you guys. Yeah. yeah I, think that's I have a pretty good that. idea of what people like me want to hear. So let's go do that. Like, and so that was kind of our, our goal without really knowing what that meant to him was like, let's try to make a really awesome record that hopefully everyone that's stoked on the band likes. And once we got the songs, I was like, yeah, this felt a lot of the things that I felt had been missing were back. Um, so I'm pretty happy with, I am definitely happy with it. Like front to back, there isn't anything I would really change. Yeah, you're right. It's probably different having somebody who, I mean, you guys have known Brian obviously for decades at this point, mm -hmm. which is again, a weird thing to say out loud, but it's probably, it lands a little easier maybe when it's the outside guy pushing you rather than that sort of takes away maybe some of the tension internally when oh, it comes yeah. to putting, putting a, an album together or writing a song or yeah and it yeah it definitely does because we can there's our we're all dealing with each other so much on such a like constant basis that there's just so much other baggage and shit that comes yeah along right it where it's like you just say that like i could literally start an argument with anyone in the band right now like, <laughs> i know exactly what to say to just like bing and they all do too so it's, it's yeah, yeah like, right right i mean brian probably does at this point too but um it's you know you can kind of being an outsider or being a producer or someone like that you you're you're a, you can burn that if you need to um and come back because you're not going to get thrown out of the band so or yeah. whatever the band's not going to break up but you can light it on fire and get it where it needs to go um with a little bit less 
on the line, I guess. Well, and then you guys can be united against a common enemy, right? <laughs> if he's pissing you all off and he's not singling anybody then out. You get, that's, and that's kind of the goal with a lot of producers, I think, that people don't realize. It's like, if I just make them mad enough at me, they'll work really hard and get something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it does help, like you said, that he's a fan of your band and he mm -hmm. knows what he likes about hot water music. And so it's as much... Um, it's as much him having that vision and pushing you guys to sort of meet that vision as it is you guys having your own internal vision. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, all of us to varying degrees don't, I don't know if everyone always has like a vision. I think there is always someone that's just, I mean, one of us, not someone else, like any of us sometimes just kind of is like, I'm here at the record. What are we doing? Kind of thing. Like we're, we got the songs, what's the plan. And this one was, I think everyone felt like there was a, a end game to it that um, we could all kind of work towards, which was helpful. It wasn't so much a like, oh, we should probably do something because we didn't need, we didn't need to make a record. We weren't going on tour. There was a lot, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff wasn't in play. So it was like, we just really wanted to make a good record. Um, and hopefully we did. No, I think you definitely did. Like I said, I think as as a longtime fan, certainly not uh, 97, I'll be honest, because I didn't jump on the hot water music train right away. And then I remember hearing Caution probably for the first time and going, what the fuck is this band? This is amazing. Like Caution became the album that I just kind of dove in headlong into the hot water music experience thing. It, I don't know why I slept on the first five years of the band or whatever. That's that's just where I jumped in stream. <laughs> and I remember thinking that, oh, my God, this like I've never heard anything like this before. I wasn't into the, I don't know, whatever it became, like we said, the org core, PBR, beard core, whatever yeah. it was, like didn't really know what that was at that point. I was still sowing my pop punk oats. Uh, but then hearing that album, I was like, what is this? But to me, there's a lot of, I don't want to say it's like caution too, because it's not by any stretch, but there's a lot of those sort of elements that made me fall in love with caution are on this album. That, I feel like that's super accurate. Like it, it, I think if I were going to compare it to another record, that would be it as far as like, it kind of, it's a complete album in that there aren't there. All the songs are pretty different from each other. Um, and they all kind of like touch on or check a box of our sort of different, uh, personalities that we have as a band um and the, you know there's a few that are kind of, there's obviously a few that are closer to each other like a couple that are kind of alike yeah, yeah, yeah. here and there um but it, it's i think that it is a very um like you know diverse and complete feeling record when i listen to it i'm like cool that was a that was a lot to good people and i don't think it was too like i don't think it was too much and i don't think it was repetitive um which is kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I know what you mean. Yeah, there are times before, not just with hot water music, but with with a lot of bands that have any sort of longevity. That sometimes I remember doing this with, I think it was Strung Out once, and that's a band that I've loved forever. And I started singing a song in my head, and it was a Strung Out song. And then I kept singing the song in my head, and I realized probably half an hour of having it stuck in my head that I had two different songs stuck in my head. I had like the verse of one and the chorus of another, except that in my head, they were the same song. And mm -hmm. I had to realize that, oh, those songs came out, not just on the same album, but a decade apart. And I was like, it's sort of a weird thing. Uh, but you certainly don't, I know that that's a trap that sometimes people fall into because it's easy to, if, you've, sure. written a, if you've written a song, like trusty chords, it's easier to write a song, just write 12 songs that sound like trusty chords and mm -hmm. call it an album and you didn't do that <laughs> um when it comes time though to to sort of i don't want to say get weird because weirds maybe the not not the right word but i don't have the right word but just to sort of mix up tempos and whatever and put a song like ride high towards the end of the album on this when it comes time to sort of play with those sort of different elements and textures what's that process like and that conversation like about how different you want to take things or should people leave things to like a flatliners project or a chuck solo project or a ship thieves that like when it comes to what direction to steer the ship in um i it's a good question um i think with us like everything here ride high being the exception and i think a little bit of habitual 
the music for Ride High was actually um, a leftover draft song that we had all even forgotten existed. And Brian had, we had recorded it with Brian, um, just never had lyrics or anything. It was just like, it was just an idea, like kind of the basic riff thing. And he was like, I found this. I think it's really cool. And I was like, I do too. In that way, we're like, we would never write this now. Yeah, but yeah. This yeah. feels like super late '90s vibe, like which is cool. I really like it. Let's since it already exists, let's see what we can do with it. And Waller just didn't really have any um, any kind of vocal plan for it. It wasn't obviously because we did it with the draft and he had never sung on it. So it was just one <laughs> yeah, of those ideas. Right. It just never whatever for whatever reason it never landed. Um, so Chuck took a crack at it and came out um, with something super cool. So that was that was kind of the weird um, process of, of getting that one together. And then some that's of the interesting because I could picture that not being I could picture that being a song that came from Chuck. So to have it right. not just that it didn't come from him, but that he wasn't involved in it at all because it was a draft song. That's yeah. actually really interesting. Everyone's been like, what happened? So like when you get the Chuck song, like ride high, and I was like, actually, that's yeah, yeah, right. like, three of us had the music for it and we just never had any vocals for it. So, so he got, and we like the bridge didn't exist. And there's a bunch of stuff obviously that we kind of like did to the skeleton that we had before. Um, and, but as far as like everyone leaving stuff to their, I feel like with Chuck, it's pretty apparent to him what to bring and what not to bring. Um, and I think, I think same thing with Waller and Cresswell. I mean, this is definitely the record where nobody brought a song. Oh, and okay. I was like, here's my thing. Um, and we kind of, I always try to shy away from that because there's only like two ways that ends, you know, it's like it ends exactly this more often than not when someone brings a song, it's very basic chord structure and a really good melody kind of thing. So then like George and I can totally destroy the musical part and deconstruct it, but only so far because the vocals have already been written to kind of like this other right, thing. Right. So what we managed to do on this one, which has been really hard to get those fucking guys to do lately is to, <laughs> is to build some of the more um, riff oriented or like bass and drums and not guitar chord oriented music and then have vocals built on top of that. So in that is a lot of how it used to go is we would have like just kind of weird jam ideas and then people would start singing on them instead of the reverse. But I guess we've now that I hadn't even thought about that, but we've been kind of reverse engineering that process a little bit recently and we went back to the original way this time. So I think as far as the weird stuff goes that's usually me and George saying how much we can destroy someone's <laughs> <laughs> um, or coming up with something that we're like daring them to try to sing over those are sort of the two ways that it, that it goes that's pretty tricky actually but I I feel like just sort of trying to run through not just this album but but sort of past albums it would be an interesting process to have somebody if he knew just that like which song came in as a essentially complete song and which song came out of a jam i wonder if there's a way how good like somebody with a trained ear could actually do at picking those songs out because they were I, I feel like on this album i i uh i sent oh the clip that you posted the other day on social media through hot water music and through music man um of mm -hmm. play, playing that riff. My brother is a bass player. And part of the reason I stopped playing bass so much is that he's my younger brother and he got really, really good at playing bass. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's, we can't have two bass players in the same family. That's strange, but, but, and he's a music teacher and whatever. And so I sent him that clip the other day. He's like, damn, my wrist hurts just watching him play that. But like some of those grooves, I feel like, uh, have been less apparent on past albums than they are on this album. And I think that's actually what I said to him at the time too. I was like, the bass is everywhere on this album and I love it. It's real fucking loud. Like there it, was actually, <laughs> there was a point in the mixing where we were like, are the guitars too quiet? And yeah, I, was yeah. like, I was like, I don't think so. Like I, they're still there. We could like everything's sitting in its place um, pretty well. But yeah, it is definitely, there's a lot of air bass on this thing. That's <laughs> McTurney keeps calling it the air bass record. <laughs> so like, yeah, for I sure. Mean, I mean, even I think I think even another breath, like right off the rip, it starts with that sort of bass groove. I'm like, oh damn. Like 
I fell in love with it right away, I think, for that reason. Um, obviously, I've been a fan of you guys for a long time, but any time that the bass, there's sort of like that lead bass thing, I, for lack of a better phrase, it's it uh, always draws me because I find it interesting. You know, it, the ability to form a groove, but still make a song that's melodic and that people want to sing and slam dance or mosh or whatever too, it is, is tough to do. It's tricky. It's harder when it's just a bunch of chords and it's easier when it's a bunch of like, which I think is sort of where we, when like a lot of the, again, like most of the music on this is like a little more riff based than chord based, even if it came with chords, like another breath is a perfect example. Chuck had like the intro idea and then the, the um, chorus progression and the bridge progression, like he sent it to, sent the idea to us with no drums and just like a vocal tag. So then I was like, oh shit, I heard this for the drums and just like programmed the drum, like the drum hits, not the like, George's drum part at all. Yeah, yeah. And then like played on keyboards what I thought could be a cool chorus progression. And then there's the song. But because it was written that way, it was wide open as far as what guitars and bass and drums were doing. So I think we allowed a lot of that to happen this time. And that's why there's like leads on everything and like, you know, cool bass and drum grooves going on because there's space for it. Um, and I think when you get into the more, like I kind of really um, at a most basic level sort of split our songs into like, these are Pegboy songs and these are Fugazi songs. Um, <laughs> and the Pegboy songs you can only do so much on if you're me and George. The right. Fugazi songs, you got a lot more room to work with. So that's, we evened out the Fugazi and Pegboy on this record. It's been a lot of Pegboy lately, and I'm glad to have the <laughs> So am I. Maybe that's a really good, I had never thought of that before, but that's a really good analogy for the, the two main sort of sonic channels that are hot water music. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's ways to do both that aren't super, like, in the ballpark of, of either band, but, like, we have definitely... Um, I feel like we kind of hit a good like stride with this one where there's just a touch of everything enough and then some kind of new like another breath is a new like I don't think we've ever done anything like that before. Um, which is part of why we haven't released it yet is because we wanted people to put the record on and hear that first and just be like what the fuck is this. Um, and I'm hoping that's the, <laughs> the impression that I'm hoping that's what happens to everyone. <laughs> well that that's sort of like when I heard caution for the first time right and I went what the fuck is this. It, it's sort of it's exactly that sort of uh exactly that sort of feeling to it cool. because i mean i i think that obviously not anybody there's not really anybody that's discovering hot water music right now i'm sure no. uh so it won't land quite that same but i think for people that have been fans of the band for a long time it'll be like whoa wait a minute <laughs> like this is this is different it's cool uh there's a song the song that cresswell sings to turn the dial is that mm -hmm. a is that a cresswell uh, you sort of already answered that in saying that nothing really came in as um, a, a completed song, but that sounds like a song that Cresswell was meant to sing. If that, he, I mean, it's got that different sort of tempo to it, and his he does a very good job at doing uh, Wallard's songs when you play live. So it's interesting to have that song feels like a Cresswell song. It doesn't feel like a Wallard song or a Chuck song. It feels like something he's meant to sing. I mean, it is definitely... That is his baby. Um, we actually started, the music for that came together at the last show we played at the Sinclair. He had like kind of that, the um, verse idea and was just playing it backstage and we we're like, what's that? So got a nice idea I've been messing around with. And so we kind of, we demoed it real quick, but he demoed it real quick backstage. We like put through a couple parts together or whatever. And then like, that was something that he and George and I just kind of kept working on um, he sent us sort of an idea, like, so what do you guys think of this? And, you know, we would rearrange it and, and got it to where it is. And then he, he wrote, I mean, the vocals are all him on that one. Um, and yeah, it's a, di it's a cool different vibe. And a lot of, st I think that we got away with a lot of things on that song that are new to the band in a cool way, um, where there are definitely like a couple chord choices that um, he came with that none of us would have come with, um, which is awesome because it's really hard to get new stuff going on in year yeah. 20, 28 or whatever. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, I think it, it, but it's, 
that's the, one of the songs that every first time people hear the record, they're like, what the fuck? And the second time, like, this song's awesome. <laughs> like, it just takes that initial, like, this is weird. No, wait, this is really cool. So that chorus gets stuck in my head a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. It'll, that's an earworm, man. It'll take yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a really cool. I'm really excited for people to hear this record. Um, is I read I saw the other day that there's another video planned. Do you have? There, there are two more. Um, oh, really? Yeah, there's one for for turn the dial for uh, Chris's song that'll be out after the record just because of scheduling stuff with the yeah, yeah. all the whatever we've got going on with getting that filmed, and then um, uh, habitual we just shot a video for. Sunday and that'll come out I think the same day the records released is kind of the plan um for that but it right around there which is only whatever 16 days from now so yeah um and then maybe we'll do more we, we ended up with a really cool team of of um video people director editor and and all that kind of stuff that um Equal Vision introduced us to, and it's we've never liked making videos. I like videos, but we've never really yeah. had a great time making them. Or, um, and we've had some done for us that are really cool, but anything that we were actually involved in was always kind of like, Ugh, <laughs> this fucking sucks. Like, yeah, yeah. And then it gets done, and it's like, oh, this looks stupid, or whatever. Like just whatever. And this, like. From the get-go, these dudes have been super rad, like super intuitive and like get what we're doing and like add it's <clears throat> there's just been a really cool extra um arm or leg of the process that I would just keep I would make videos for everything on the record at this point with those. Yeah, guys. yeah. It well it look it looks like that collect your things and run video, it looks like you guys are having fun. Yeah, and, and, that and was that... kind of the point with that one, is it's like everything fucking sucks right now so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's cool like this song actually while it's like the lyrics are kind of heavy right the vibe of the song is fun and when i listened to it i was like it's just kind of for whatever reason gives me like an agent orange vibe or like just a cool southern california like skate punk vibe and not in like no disrespect to like dri or whatever like not in that kind of nasty way but in the more fun like just like yeah, yeah, yeah. Order, you know yeah. and uh the original idea was like well shit, we used to find out about so many bands watching skate videos when we were kids right. like, let's right. what if we did that and then like one of our friends it turns out that like andrew cannon at santa cruz like actually wallard knew him one of our really good friends um knows him really well and introduced us and they were like oh my god this is awesome let's let's see what riders we can get and we got fucking all these awesome riders to to be a part of it so it um it turned out really it turned out really really cool and that was just our idea was to make it like kind of the same vibe as we had growing up where like skating was such an extension of punk um for so long that we were you know kind of wanted to bring that fun vibe back and i mean that thing we don't have that thing's already the amount of people that watch that video is crazy compared to everything else so far um, is that a thing you keep your eye on or at least one eye on? <laughs> sometimes like with that one in particular, because it, the reaction was really strong, like yeah. it's interesting to keep an eye on. The other ones, it's kind of like, I don't know how much we're, we are, I mean, our demographic of fans is like pretty old. So it's, right. we're like a Facebook band more than a, like, <laughs> you know, like it's so it, there are people that'll watch the video on YouTube, but it's not like the, that isn't the go-to spot for folks. So it's kind of a like, it's, it's interesting. I keep an eye on it in that interesting way where I'm like, I'm wondering how this kind of is reacting or whatever. Um, I but think it's a rewatchable video, if that makes yeah. sense. Like like sometimes when there's a concept video, they can be really good. But once you've seen a concept video, sometimes it's like, okay, that's like, I saw it, that was cool. But I feel like it's because it's fun. Uh, it's like the old skate videos where you could just put on a skate video and Watch the same video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, put it on talking shit with everyone and whatever the video is on. Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad that we succeeded in kind of getting that vibe across. How have uh, how have the first shows back out since this last shutdown been? How was last week's shows? I mean, I I feel like anytime you can play or watch a veil play is a good day. But uh, oh yeah, for sure. Um, it's been fine. Like we the we did four shows earlier last month. Now 
Um, and those were all good and nothing. I mean, there's a little, there was still a little bit, the shows we did earlier in February, there was still a little bit of like, like Baltimore was sold out, but maybe a hundred people didn't show up kind of thing. Um, and yeah. that's, that's been kind of par for the course for a lot of bands. I think that's fading now that we're at where we're at. Um, and the shows of the veil were great. Like they were all sold out and everyone came and it was fun. And it, you know, we've been pretty, it's just been kind of pretty much nobody backstage kind of program. Um, we're not doing like crazy touring bubbles or anything yeah, like that. Cause yeah. we don't, we don't really have the, we're not in a bus, so we don't really have the way to do that. Um, but uh, it's been fun. I mean, I definitely feel like people needed the shows, so. That's awesome that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's a that's a lineup that I mean, obviously, for a lot of people, there were times in the last 20 years where it seemed like neither one of those bands would exist anymore. Uh, yeah. Certainly, certainly for a much longer time for Avail. Um, but that was a band that was never going to play again. And I think there were some of us that thought that Hot Water Music wouldn't for a while. Uh, it's sort of like the Jawbreaker thing, right? Let's just like mm -hmm. they're ne they're only going to exist in our memories and and crappy VHS tapes that somebody uploaded to YouTube or whatever. And so to have that sort of bill is pretty, pretty amazing. And I wish that I lived closer to the Southeast, not that strike anywhere and be well, uh, who are coming up here in a couple of weeks. Uh, not that they're slouches by any stretch of the imagination, but. It was, a, I mean, it's something that we, like we had talked about doing these shows kind of a while back. Um, I don't remember how it came up, but I knew that they wanted to do, I don't know if we just thought, if I just talked to Tim or something about doing it, but they were wanting to do shows like down in this general area. And when they came up and then when we started coming up, like the Southeast was really great for shows, at least for them and us and some other bands, like from the general area. And it's gotten pretty bad lately. I feel like, um, it, like it just isn't like how it used to be. You used to be able to, really like kind of hit, you know, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and have a ton of good shows. And it just isn't quite like that anymore. And I don't know the reason, at least for our bands, and I don't know the reason for that. So the thought was like, if you guys want to do this, we should probably try to do it together because I feel like that'll make the shows really good. Cause then we're going to get, everyone's going to get a babysitter and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, you know, so <clears throat> it worked. Um, I mean, I hope we, you know, maybe we'll do some more shows in the future before one of us is done doing shows again, who knows? <laughs> um, but that was, it was pretty special for us because that's kind of like, it was a little bit of a homecoming for both bands doing those shows together. Um, so it, it was super cool. And I feel like the crowd um, definitely responded to that. Yeah, I definitely didn't think, I mean, I know I saw them on my 40th birthday. They played Sinclair. Uh, no, mm -hmm. they didn't. They played Royale which is a thousand cap room in Boston, which used to be the Roxy. And they played that on my 40th birthday. And I remember thinking, well, I'll probably never see them again. Cause I just assumed they would come out of the woodwork for those shows. And then like six months later, the world shut down. I figured that was kind of it. Bobo moved to Costa Rica or wherever. And mm -hmm. I figured that like, that was it. And I'd be happy. And then they started playing shows again. I, they are also coming back up here uh on the frank turner tour it's like frank yeah. Tur frank turner and the bronx and avail it was like where the hell did that lineup come from <laughs> frank's been doing i mean he's good at like get, he likes to pay it back um yeah. and which i really appreciate about him and he's brought out some really cool lineups for this insane i'm not sure how he thinks he's going to make it to all 50 states without somebody testing positive in a show getting canceled but i mean if he can do it awesome <laughs> i I talked to him for an episode of this uh, the day before that was announced officially. And mm -hmm. so he off, like once we stopped recording, he sort of told me that like the whole plan for 50 states in 50 days, it sounds, it, I mean, it, it has always been a thing that would sound overwhelming in yeah. good touring times. Now, like you said, I don't know how, I mm -hmm. mean, maybe, maybe because there's a mix of like solo acoustic shows. So yeah. maybe that keeps it small. I don't know, but he's, he's always been one of those guys that's super accessible to people too. So then like, do you piss off the fans by having the bubble, but then you have to have the bubble because you're doing 50 States in 50 days. Like, I don't. 
Not and something it, I want. I'm glad I don't have to figure those logistics he, out. He said his booking agent and his manager repeatedly said, are you sure you want to fucking do this? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, thanks for doing this. I'm really excited for, like I said, for people to hear the album, for people to uh, come out to the shows. I think I think the Northeast run is up next, right? A couple of yeah, weeks from now. Yeah, it is. That's the next thing. Then we have um, a little run in Canada, and then we're kind of taking it easy. And then a couple of things here and there in the summer. Um, kind of our usual program of working around everyone being in two bands and just trying not to overwhelm ourselves so and that there is still a pandemic out there right like also I think true. Also people true. sort of forget that I, I know that we're all sort of done with it but uh. yeah but yeah it's very true and it's it's super it playing shows is weird because it's depending on where you are it's super easy I mean we went from the first show this last run in Chapel Hill Carborough pretty much everyone in the venue had a mask on the whole time like remarkably more than any other show we've played as far as the really country. to St. Pete show in Florida, 1500 people with like no masks anywhere. Yeah. So it's just, it's like, you kind of just had, once you leave the house on tour, it's like, all right, here I go. I'm going to do what I can do. And we will hope for the best. I suppose it was probably a weird thing to get used to playing a show, seeing people wearing masks, but then at some point it becomes the opposite. It's weird to start, like, you get used to seeing people in masks, even being at the grocery store. And mm -hmm. then you see people that stop wearing masks at the grocery store. It's like, what the fuck? So, yeah. so I yeah. can imagine that once you get used to seeing a thousand people with masks on, and then they're not. <laughs> yeah, and also realizing that in between songs is really quiet because everyone has a mask on. And that's just, they're quieter because of it. You're like, oh, shit. Like, everyone's clapping, but no one can scream because their face is covered. Like, yeah, got yeah. it, got it. So, yeah, it's been... <laughs> been wild no doubt uh i'm really looking forward to it thanks like i said thanks for doing this the out al the album is out uh the 18th i think is the official date yeah something like that do we know when huh. did, did adele screw things up for you guys too do we know when the actual albums are gonna... i think we're gonna be pretty close um, okay that was kind of why we pushed it to march as much as we did um it the last we heard was the lp should be ready early april which is one of those like fingers crossed they'll just be ready on time um so we were planning on may so anything better than that is is that was the last like kind of solid thing we had but now they're looking at april so hopefully Maybe it might even be ready for release day. Who knows? That's good. That's surprising. Yeah. That's no, not the way things have been trending from anybody that I've talked to. No, not <laughs> at all. Sort of like you decide, you pick a release date, and then ultimately the physical album comes out when it comes out. Yeah, it's you do your best. Um, yeah. And we we pushed it as far as we felt comfortable with to try to get everything to line up. Um, and you know, hopefully we're not too far off. Has the writing process continued? Like since that, I mean, I would imagine this stuff has been in the can for a while now. But has that um, continued or are you seeing how this goes first? We, it hasn't. I think everyone's just trying to, I think once the record's out, maybe then we can kind of like memory hold that thing and move on with new stuff. But like um, George is in the studio with the Souls right now. Uh, Chris just finished a new Flatliners record. I think it's finally mastered and mixed. So there's a lot of everyone else kind of like we finished this and everyone went to other stuff um, kind of right off the bat. So. I would say once this is out, probably, you know, maybe by summertime, we'll start messing with some new stuff again, I think. That's good. I like that the wheels are in motion, I think. Yeah, they're definitely like still still moving, just not not very quickly right now. Well, things are better and things make more sense when when the music that we know and love is still being made, you know, like For I think sure. there's, there's a lot of us that look to you guys rightly or wrongly or unfairly or not as as sort of like uh as sort of like the light guiding light or whatever you know so to have to know that there's bands like hot water music still out there caring and playing music is is reassuring i think oh, thanks. things sorry. are really <laughs> fucked up right now <laughs> yeah so, oh. for in myriad different levels uh mm -hmm. and so it's nice to know that like that that's the stuff that connects us all so right on. so Please. so thanks uh